Let's stand together, take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew is the first book of our New Testament, chapter 11 this morning. Thank you for being in the Lord's house on this day. How I appreciate so much the faithfulness of God's people that would come from wherever you came, and many come from Chicago, from DeMont, from uh, Crown Point and Portage and Hobart, from Dalton and South Holland and different places throughout our area here and right here in Hammond and Calumet City. Thank you for being faithful to get from where you are to the services today. I want to encourage you back tonight at 6 o'clock and then once again for the uh, special concert in the Grand Lobby there at 5 o'clock. You'll enjoy that as well, I'm sure. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 28, 29, and 30. Let's all read it together in unison. Are you ready? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege to be able to share for a few moments from your wonderful word, the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for Brother Colston, who normally leads us in reading, but because of the change of the platform, he's taking a reprieve today. But thank you that the same Bible that he's been reading out of it still goes on, still works in our hearts. Well, I need you desperately this morning. I feel nervous. I feel careful to say the right things and to be a help and a blessing. I know that you do not need me, but I need you again. The people in this room are people that I love like family. I know them, and I spend more time with them than I do my own siblings, and mom, and aunts, and uncles. Thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness to you. Thank you for their camaraderie love for Christ. Please, I pray you would help us this morning as we look into your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Of course, there, the New Testament, the Bible comes to us in two sections. The Old Testament, 39 books written before Jesus came. The New Testament, 27 books written after Jesus goes back to heaven. All of it is the Bible. The Bible is one book with 66 books included. In the first part of the New Testament, after Jesus goes back to heaven, four men are used of God like ink pens. They're moved by the Holy Spirit of God to tell about the life of Jesus. Now, the book of John tells us if you told about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, all the books of the world could not contain what he did and the significance of what he did while he was here. He only lived here 33 years on this world in a human form. How many of you are older than 33 years of age? Would you raise your hand? Probably almost half the crowd would be in that group. I passed 33 more years ago than I'm proud of, for sure. But in that quick 33 years, he was used of God immensely. He was hidden for the first 30 years in the city of Nazareth, a a no-name city, the other, other side of the tracks, a place that people had great prejudice against. Matter of fact, when someone said he was from Nazareth, one of his followers, who had not been his follower yet, but Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of that place? And yet he was in hiding for 30 years, and then he appeared to uh, John the Baptist, his cousin. His mom, Mary, and John's mom, Elizabeth, were cousins. uh, John was born six months before Jesus. And his whole purpose of life, God had called him to prepare the people there in that little Judean area of Israel for their Messiah. To tell the Jewish people that their Messiah was alive and they can anticipate his coming. And if they believed that, they would, he would ask them, if you believe that Jesus Christ is alive today, I want to encourage you to follow the Lord in baptism. It was not the baptism that we'll see this morning. That's done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This was baptism was to affirm in their hearts that the Messiah was alive and they would be looking for him. And they would turn from what they were doing and, and begin to work toward uh, anticipating the Messiah's coming. One day, in the line of people that were being baptized, Jesus stood in the line. 
Jesus stood in the line and John was in the river Jordan. And Jesus was next and John saw him and he said, uh, Jesus said, John, I want you to baptize me. And the Bible says that John forbade him or he argued with him. He said, I'm not going to baptize you. I'm not even worthy to tie your shoestrings, much less baptize you. But if you want to baptize me, you can baptize me. And then Jesus said to John, no, it's to fulfill all righteousness that you baptize me. And then John said, okay, I'll baptize you. And he did. And when Jesus was baptized, he, it was obvious. It was like the heavens opened up, the clouds separated, and God's presence rested on him and the eyes of the people that saw him that day like a bird would fly out of a tree and land on someone's head or shoulder. It was that obvious that something different happened to him after his baptism. Then they heard the voice of God from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God's voice appeared that day and said, this is my son and he has a purpose. And everyone got to hear that being shared to the people beside that little river that day. From there, he went about to fast and pray for 40 days, and then he selected 12 men over a period of several months, one by one. One was a tax collector, Matthew, and other, others were fishermen, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and others had other occupations, and people he had met in other parts of Israel where they were from. Most of them were from Galilee, and Judas being from Judea, but he picked each of them out. And they, he ordained them that they would be with him and follow him for the next three years of their life. And they forsook all and followed Jesus. They left their jobs. They left their families, families temporarily to go with him up and down from Capernaum and from the Sea of Galilee back down to Jerusalem several times a year while Jesus would heal the sick and preach the word of God, do amazing miracles and challenge and then always with opposition, always with problems. And God gave four men a responsibility to log Jesus' life. Matthew is where the book we are today. He reminds us that Jesus is the king. In Mark, Jesus is the man. He's the son of man. In Luke, he's, uh, excuse me, in Mark, he's the servant. In Luke, he's the son of man. And in John, he's God. In the book of Matthew, it opens up in verse number 11, chapter 11, and verse number 1, with John, now a year has gone by since he baptized Jesus. And John has now been arrested, and he's put in jail. And at a low point of his life, he's in jail, and no doubt he hears the soldiers talk and say, hey, I think they're going to take your head off quickly. Word is on the street that you're going to go to court and they're going, to, they're going to execute you, John. And maybe in a weak moment, some of his friends came to visit him, some of his disciples, that guys would follow him, his protégés. And he said, to, they said to, he said to them, he said, listen, guys, would you go see if Jesus is really the Messiah or ask him, do we look for somebody else? He came prey to doubt. He was nervous if he really, if Jesus was really Messiah. Now, he heard the voice of God. He saw the experience there at the River Jordan. He knew him since he was a child, but in a moment of difficulty, John began to weaken. And he said, guys, go find out if he's really the Messiah, if we look for somebody else. I can imagine the two men of John following and going over to where Jesus was, and he was busy about the work of the Lord. And they asked him, they said, uh, Jesus, we're sent by John. It's kind of embarrassing. But he wants to know if you're the real Messiah or do we look for somebody else? You could imagine Jesus could have gotten angry and said, what? Are you kidding me? He would ask that dumb question, but he didn't. Very graciously, he said, men, go back and tell John. I know you're going to see him in jail. And, and, of course, Jesus knew that he would be in a short time in the presence of the Lord. He said, but go back and tell him. Tell him that the deaf hear and the blind see and the leprous people, they get clean from their leprosy and the dead are raised again and that the gospel is preached unto people who are poor who will listen to the word of God. 
And with that information, with the words of God on their lips, through the person of Jesus Christ, they went back and told John, and John said, I'm fine now. By the way, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. By the way, you get away from church, you get away from your Bible reading, your prayer, your meditation, and your faith will weaken too. But the word of God brings that faith. In this passage of scripture also in chapter 11, Jesus begins to go up into Galilee and there he comes to cities that were Jewish cities that he was raised in that area and he, they had seen the miracles that he had done and they still rejected him as the Messiah. And he gives some warnings out to him. He says, look, you had a choices. You could have accepted me, but instead you've rejected me. He said, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, those who are wicked Gentile cities that have been destroyed years before. They'll be more tolerable at the judgment of Christ for, for, for those cities who did not even, who rejected, who rejected the truth because they didn't have enough information. You had miracles. You've had so many things that God's done in your life. You rejected the Lord. And then he also got a hold of Capernaum, another city where Peter and James and John were from and and he said, I've preached here and you guys have rejected me. It'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for those who have received God's word. May I just say to you just for a moment, I'd like everybody to listen for this. Listen to this very carefully. Many of us were raised under the preaching of God's word. We went to Christian schools, not all of us, but many of us did. We've had Sunday school teachers who have loved us and prayed for us. We've had parents that have loved us and prayed for us. We've had so many things given for us spiritually. We've had so many life-changing messages, we don't even know who we are. And if you take that, friend, and you go a different direction and, and away from the Lord Jesus Christ, you carry a very heavy upon your heart. It will not be a beautiful thing when you stand before Jesus Christ. You will rue the day that you stepped out of church. You'll rue the day that you turned your back on the things of God. You'll rue the day that you chose excuses over the exalted Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that principle. He said, it would be more tolerable than Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a wicked, vile place than for a people who have heard the gospel of Christ, who have been instructed in the things of God, and then turn away from that. Well, he comes down to it, and he goes to the Father, and he says in, in, the, in the end of the chapter, in Matthew chapter 11, he says, Lord, and let's look at it real quick. You can see it better for yourself and better than I could say it, but look at 25. And at the time Jesus said, I thank thee, Father, he prayed as he stepped away from those judgments. To the Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father... For so it is seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me for, of thy father, of my father. No man knoweth the son but the father. Neither knoweth any man the father save the son and he whom the son will reveal to him. Here the Bible he prays. And, and by the way, this is a great testimony. Here he is. He preached. He gave a warning. And then he walked and God records his walk and his talk with the father. By the way, it's a good thing to pray all the time. While he walks away from that judgment, he says, Father, thank you for making the gospel so clear. The wise and the prudent, the intellectuals of the day, they reject you, but thank you that even a child can accept you as their Savior. Thank you that you revealed it to just the simple people, and they would be willing to believe and receive. I'm glad you did that. That's what he kind of summarized that. But then he comes to our text today, Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly and you'll find rest for your souls. For my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. One thing that I have seen about the holiday season, and I really would further say the Christmas season, but we throw New Year's in there, that many times as much enjoyment and fun and thankfulness I have for this time that many of my friends who go through this holiday season get very overwhelmed. Stress seems like it elevates. We're supposed to be happy people. I went to the South Lake Mall to see some of our members play in a stringed uh, performance last night and enjoyed it so very much. 
But as I walk around the mall, I see so much uh, hype. So much people looking for fun, enjoyment. Looking for opportunities to maybe also bless people with a gift and experience stress. I watched moms and dads as they were trying to corral their children in the toy store with their kids saying, give me this, give me that, show me where my treasure's at. You know, they're just, uh, they want all that. And the parents are just stressed out. Get over here. Get over here. You know, they're just, I felt sorry. Here's Christmas time and there's yelling. I heard people cursing, angry, frustrated, yelling at one another. Husband and wife frustrated at, at, at being at the mall together. I remember years ago finding times in my own, in my upbringing where my dad was, his Christmases weren't that good. He lived in a home of an alcoholic. And I think at Christmas time came, he was once again a first generation Christian and trying to provide something in a poor state we just never had a lot of money, and I remember the stress, and sometimes there'd be nothing, but he would just say, you think money grows on trees, John? And I knew it wasn't me, it was, I did learn later, it wasn't me, it's just he felt stressed, because he wanted to do more for us, he wanted to have that, and every Christmas, I found him to get a little bit oppressed, as wonderful as a daddy was, he did everything wonderful, but I could tell it stressed him. I can see it's not happened just because of Christmas and not just because of the pressure of the holiday seasons and, and the materialism that's come with our day. But you know, some people live that way all the time. Stressed and frustrated. Oppressed. Challenged by the things that happen. I want to just give you a couple options that you can have for challenging times from this passage of Scripture. Would you look at it with me? I want you to notice, first of all, our off condition. Notice the condition that Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that what? And are laboring and laden. Here are two of the problems that you and I have, and, 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 and all of us struggle with this sometimes. Some people are shackled under the labor of trying to earn their way to heaven. Keeping the law making sure that you do the right thing so you can earn your way to heaven. That's not possible. The secret of eternal life is to learn that it cannot be earned. But some people, they're, they're weighted under the labor of trying to earn their way to heaven. In this world, trying to earn fame or appreciation or get things. Some folks, they know how to get to heaven from here. They know it's not by works, it's by the grace of God. But yet, they're pressured by trying to make it in a world and measuring up to what other people have and what other people think you ought to have and trying to get this and have that and have the American dream. By the, by the way, the, the American dream is not necessarily in the Bible. <laughs> but we measure ourselves among ourselves, which is not wise. And we compare ourselves and we feel like if someone has more than us, then they're rich and I'm poor. When really if I have what I need, I have everything I need, and God has given me everything I need to be presently happy. But many labor, they're struggling for that next, the grass is always greener, that next move, that next job, that next career change. When we move here, when we get out of this dump and get over to that, and we have this, and they, they have the labor that goes on with that. Some labor in this world to have success and honor and ease, and others are trying to work toward a retirement where they can have a life of ease after years of work, and others are laboring under the legislation and the, 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 the dedication this world pushes. Others are laboring under sin and Satan's control. They're trying to find happiness in an alcohol bottle or a needle or some pills trying to numb out some things, or, or through partying, or, or through entertainment. They're, they're going through lust and drink and try to fit into the world system. They're laboring. Others are laden. Heavy laden is the words that Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. The heavy laden, and oftentimes the heavy burdens that come in our lives are burdens of weariness and disappointment. Things are just not happening like I wish they could happen. I find myself sometimes being at mid, mid, mid age and thinking, you know, am I, did I ever think I'd be here? Or, or it's not what I wanted to have happen. 
Some people find themselves stuck in a marriage or stuck in a job and, and they, all they think about is this is not the way it was supposed to happen and that bears on them heavily. Others are carrying the heavy weight of guilt of past decisions and sinful activities and burning through years of sin and wickedness and selfishness, not thinking about anybody and certainly not thinking about future and not thinking about God or heaven or others. Some are carrying the weight of care and anxiety, some of greed. Others are carrying the weight of sorrow and poverty and oppression. It just seems like I can't win. Heaviness that comes from that. Jesus speaks to a group of people and says, listen, all ye that labor, all ye that are heavy laden, some struggle with doubt. They wonder if God really exists. Does God really love them? Is the Bible true? Is sin all that bad? It was what my mom and my dad taught me. Is the, is the church and, and, the, and the teachings of, that I've heard in church and in school, is it true and doubt and conflicts and confusion settle in? And it's a heavy burden. And it's also blurred by sinful activities and habits and music and entertainment and false philosophies and traditions of men and not after Christ that we oftentimes succumb to. Jesus says, hey, listen, I know the condition that many of you are facing. It's a laboring condition. It's a laden condition. It's heavy. It weighs on you. We find also the Bible tells us here that uh, he gives us our real possibility. Notice, if you would, please, in verse number one, verse 28, the Bible says, Come to me, all you that labor heavy laden, I will give you what? If you came in this morning, as many people have come, and as I have come in a church service like this before, I have come and my heart has been labored and laden, and weariness and doubt and conflict have been a reality in my heart. You don't live 49 years, you don't live 20 years without having those days. And many of us have come into those doors today, also labored by the very things we've just described, laden by the very realities and emotions but the bible says there is an option that's available and that's rest you got to have rest to make progress the bible tells us here in two times in this few three verses that he says i will give you rest god wants to give rest you know rest is a gift from god you know the whole world can be going crazy and you can still have rest inside of your being if Jesus gives you that rest. And you know, it not only says you can have the rest as a gift from God, but then there's also another found rest that you can find rest for your souls. I want you to notice that real quickly. Number one, I want you to notice, first of all, the rest that is offered. It's a rest of conscience. You know how your conscience is cleared? It's cleared through confession and forgiveness. Some of us, we struggle with conscience. You know it. You close your eyes at night. It's the reason you tip the bottle. It's the reason you, you run to the video machine. It's the reason that you gamble. It's the reason that, that you have to find some other thing to get your mind off of the conscience that's being seared by sin. But there's a better way to deal with the conscience. It's called forgiveness. It's called confession to God. I'm glad for the Bible verse. You probably know it. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's available. For the conscience, God can give rest to the conscience through forgiveness. He can give rest to the mind through instruction and establishment. He can give rest to your energy by giving you something, an object worth obtaining. You know, I... I have done a lot of, I've expended a lot of energy in my little time on this world, and you have too. Have you ever watched, done a lot of energy, and then at the end, you found out that you, you climbed a ladder, but your ladder was, was tilted against the wrong building? You worked at something, you found out at the end of it, it didn't even matter? One thing that rest comes is when you get to do something that matters for eternity. That brings a great blessing. But then there's also a rest that you find. A rest that really is because of a settled allegiance to the Lord. 
You know, many people, the Bible says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But there's a rest that comes when you have complete allegiance to the Lord. When people try to live for the world and live for themselves and live for God, it creates conflict and frustration within us. Many people struggle with that. Trying to live for God and trying to live for self. Someone said on a little, a little poem, there's just two choices on the shelf. You either live for God or you live for self. And James said that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. There's instability. But there is stability that you find whenever you give your allegiance to the Lord. When you sell out for Him. When you're committed to serve the Lord. I was talking to a man this week, and he's in the room today. And he said, for so many years, Pastor, he said, I just tried to fit God into my schedule. I tried to, to, to live my life and include God as one of the spokes of my life. He said, but you know what? I found nothing but frustration. And you'll find frustration. There won't be rest that way. You know when, it, when you have rest is when Jesus is the hub. He's not fit into your life. He is your life. I am crucified with Christ. And it's a struggle that you and I have when we do not, we don't have rest when, we, when we're trying to live for the world. You try to listen to the world's music and say amen on Sunday morning. You try to be at peace with God and at the same time try to please everyone around you. You just can't do it. You're going to find conflict until you... I, this week we were watching some basketball and before the basketball games we played the national anthem. I thank God for the national anthem. I thank God for America. It, I'm bothered when people do not stand and give attention to the United States flag. I don't like people standing like this. I don't like people bowing their head and talking. To themselves or anyone else, I like them when they look at that flag, they put their hand over their heart, and they think about the wonderful joy of being an American. I usually try to pray for the, star, the stars represent the states. I try to pray for pastors and people in that thing. I think about the red stripes that remind me of the cost and the price of freedom, the royalty and the thankfulness and the lineage of America. But I think about that as I'm glad that in our, in our, in our schools anyway, when the national anthem is rung, the, the, the teachers uh, have instructed the young people, their parents have instructed them, you stand up straight, you put your hand over your heart, not over your stomach, not on your shoulder, you put it right here and you start thinking about the blessings of being an American. And I love for a few minutes, everybody takes their hats off, the men take their hats off, and they stop and they pledge allegiance to the flag. But you know, just the same Every so often, I need to stand at the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and pledge my allegiance to Him and say, you are my life. You're not just a part of me, you're my life. And what I can exchange for that is rest inside of me. You can't live a godly life on a diet of your decisions and God's blended together. It won't happen. He needs to be paramount and preeminent in our life. I noticed, number one, the condition, and that is we labor and we're laden. It just comes with living. But we have an opportunity, and that is to have rest. Rest that is given to us, and rest we find by allegiance and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to show you the last thing, if I can, and that is our available invitation. Notice the first word of verse 28. Would you read it with me? What's the first word? Come. Probably one of the most beautiful words in the Bible is the word come. Have you ever, uh, I remember years ago, I, of course, my dad used to tell me, if you ever got pulled over by a police officer, you probably ought to get out of your car and walk back to him and, and, and you know, tell him, you know, make it easier for him. Well, that doesn't work today. You understand that, right? <laughs> One day I was just a young man and I got in, I, I, I don't know if I did, did a California stop or I was going to vest. I don't remember my violation. There's been so many of them to remember. I'm just joking. However, I did something wrong, and, and uh, so I got out of my car and made my way back, and the man got on the speaker, stop! Don't come any farther. I thought, well, okay. You know, I said, but, you know, I, I remember being like very like, what's wrong with this guy? You know, why is he so, he's keeping me away. Have you ever wanted to get close to someone and they kept you away? That's not how Jesus, one of his favorite words is coming to me. 
Before he ends the Bible in Revelation chapter 1, he said, Oh, the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And he that is thirst, you come. And here is a wonderful opportunity for everyone who is laden with sin. Everyone who's laden and, and laboring in the world and the rat race we live in, he has an invitation. You can find rest for your souls if you'll come. You know, that's a wonderful thing because you can come to him. He didn't say come to church. I love the church, but the church is not the end of rest. It is just an instrument of rest. It brings us to Jesus. My friends I met this morning back here, Brett and George and Mark, they didn't get saved because of the church. They got saved because of Jesus. But because you give, and they can put some fuel in a bus and go to Chicago and bring our friends, it's the, the church is the tool that God uses. To bring. All of us got saved because of a church somewhere along the line. Someone he gave for us. But Jesus, he says, come unto me. No, it's easy, and it's no, it's no wonder why it's so hard to think about Jesus. Many of us, we haven't even thought about him all week long. We haven't thought about him today. We've been here all morning. We haven't thought about Jesus. But he says, come unto me, the person of Jesus. Who is Jesus? You know him. He's the son of God. He's the one who left heaven to become a man, to suck air in this world and to do nothing but good, to get nothing but bad. He is he who God made to be sin for us who didn't have any sin, that we be made the righteous of God in him. Because real peace comes through the person of Jesus. Not only for salvation, but for the Christian life. If you're struggling with peace today, it's because you don't have a right relationship with Jesus. If you're overwhelmed by the labor and the laden of doubt and guilt and shame and frustration and, and all the disappointments you have, it's it's probably because you've lost your focus upon Jesus. In Hebrews, the Hebrew author says this. He said, consider him. Consider Jesus, who endured all contradiction of sinners. And if you don't do this, you'll weary and faint in your mind. Dear friend, Jesus invites you to come to him. Come and receive help from his person. Because he's the reason, it's Jesus. And then he says, take my yoke upon you. Not only come to Jesus, but obey Jesus. Determine you'll serve Jesus. Determine you will bear that bur burden. You know, the, the yoke, the eastern yoke, was, it was fit for two heads, for two necks. And they would put two animals in there, and then they would lock them up. And now they were... They, they would pull that, uh, that, 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 that uh, plow together or that, that, that uh, wagon or that load together. But here Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. You know, when you're in that yoke, you go wherever each other goes. You lose your independence. If one of the oxen said, I'm going this way, the other one said, I'm going this way, they're going to go together. You know, that's one of the things that we struggle with oftentimes. Some of you, God wants you to do things you're not, you're not ready to do. You want out of the yoke. And he says, take my yoke. And then he says the third thing, learn of me. Stay in school, but grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep learning about the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you come into the room today or maybe in life labored and heavy laden? There is rest available. Rest that God will give you and rest that you can find as you turn to Jesus and you realize that he's enough. He's your real aim. Going with him means I'm going to give up my independence. I'm going to go where he goes and I'm going to bear whatever he bears for me and then I'm going to learn about him. You know, to know John Wilkerson is not necessary to love me because I'm, I'm a failure. I fail often. I'm selfish. I'll disappoint you. The more I learn about you, I probably would get a little disappointed as well. But the more we learn about Jesus, the more we'll love him. And we can trust him and experience his peace and his rest. Let's pray together, can we?